Welcome to the Voice of Reason, Carolina Charm with California Wit, whether it's the law, politics, relationships, or recipes for the kitchen. The Voice of Reason is online and in all our hearts. Now, please welcome the Voice of Reason, Mr. Ted Durden. Good evening, and welcome to another show of the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Ted Durden, and we're going to kick off 2019 with a lot of topics, a lot of reports, a lot of ground that we need to cover. First, I'm going to start off with an old school nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a big fall. All the soldiers and all the men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And of course, I know you're smart enough to realize the metaphor that I'm making reference to is Donald Trump and his insistence on having this wall built. Now, the reasoning behind it, I understand. He thinks that is the best way to stop illegal immigration into this country. The problem that I have with it is we now have 800,000 governmental employees that have been furloughed or, or working without pay. Now, he sits in the comfort of the White House or he could sit in the comfort of any of a number of homes that he owns, even down to Mar-a-Lago in Florida. He's not affected by the shutdown other than his reputation may be taking a hit with the American people. I'm also of the mindset that when there's a governmental shutdown, if one single employee is not being paid, no one should be paid. Congress shouldn't be paid. House of Representatives, the Senate, no one should be paid. Although the reality of the situation is for those members in both who have been there for a long time, if they didn't get paid, they would not feel it that much. Now, the incoming members, they probably would. But I think if there was a governmental shutdown, no one should be immune to it, not even Donald Trump. But again, it wouldn't affect him that much because he's a multi-gazillionaire anyway. So let's talk about a lot of the things that have been going on specifically at the board. I want to shift off that subject for just a moment. On December 12th of last year, that group of illegal immigrants that came from Central America, they made a demand upon our federal government. And they said, if you want us to leave, if you want us to go home, what you need to do is pay each and every one of us $50,000. That is the most absolutely insane thing I have ever heard of. No one asked you to come here. No one invited you to come here. You come here at your own peril. You come here at your own risk. You arrive and you find that what you're facing is unexpected. Did you really think that the throng of all of you, these people that were coming here, were just going to be accepted into the United States with open arms because of the plight that you have back at home, back in Central America, back in Honduras or Guatemala? You have no idea the hundreds of thousands of American citizens who face poverty every day, who don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And yet we're just supposed to take on more financial burden because of what's occurring for you at home. As much as I may sympathize or empathize with you, I can't get there from here. I can't put your needs above the needs of the American people of the everyday citizen that struggles every day in this society who has found themselves crushed by this economy. And then the lot of these people with their unmitigated gall, then want to say, fine, if you won't take us in, if you won't let us come in, then you need to pay us to leave. I would say what I think we should do, but it's illegal. So I won't do that. And then let's talk about some of the things that has arisen as a result of these throng of illegal immigrants that have assaulted our borders. And that is the deaths of children. Now, 
I think when the most vulnerable of us dies, I think it diminishes us all. Even if it is the daughter or the son of a little immigrant, someone who wants to get into this country because of what they believe that it offers them as far as future and a path to happiness, financial freedom, as it were. But I take issue with the media or anyone that tries to lay the blame at Border Patrol. When my son gets sick, or my daughter gets sick, and especially when they were minors, the only person that was to blame was me. If I didn't take the necessary precaution to make sure that my children were well or well fed or probably taken care of, that falls to me. The blame falls squarely on my shoulders. The first child that died, it died from dehydration after eight hours. No one dies from dehydration after eight hours unless they're sitting out in the blazing sun of the Mojave Desert with no shelter in sight. So there were obvious complications before the child even arrived. And you have to take into consideration that the child had no voice. The child had no say. The child had no choice. When his or her parents decided to make that treacherous trip from Central America, it's the parents' fault. If they didn't do what was necessary to provide for that child, give that child warmth and shelter and make sure they had whatever they would need in order to secure their safety and their health on this treacherous journey. The other child that died, it turned out, if I recall correctly, had pneumonia. Again, because why? You look at the time of year that it is and the elements that they're exposed to. And that's something that that child had contracted prior to coming to the border. So, in my opinion, the blame for any child that dies at the border, unless there is overwhelming evidence that it was due to a border patrol agent that had a direct hand in their death, lies squarely on the hands of the parents. And again, you look at what happened just this past weekend or might have been last week when Border Patrol had to fire tear gas because the illegal immigrants at the border being frustrated began throwing rocks at them and attacking them, which again, it's, it's just stupid. It's just absolutely stupid. That's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. You know what's going to happen. You're going to get your ass kicked. And that's exactly what happened. So then the border patrol is forced to fire tear gas to stop them from throwing rocks. And I'm sure some of the children that were present there might have been overwhelmed by the fumes, may require medical attention. But again, it lays at the feet of the parents or the other adults that were there that were inciting violence against our Border Patrol agents when all they're doing is their job. That's all they're doing. You don't have to like it, but that doesn't give you the right, the privilege to engage in caveman warfare, because that's the only thing I can liken it to since they were throwing rocks and bottles and the like. Anything that happens there lays at their feet. I view that as no different than what happened during the Iraq war when they used human shields or they would take up residence and hospitals knowing or hoping that the United States would not bomb it because of civilian casualties. I didn't have a problem. The United States bombed them. If innocents died, that wouldn't lay on my conscience. If your fellow countrymen put you at risk again, that lays at your feet. And I feel the same way about those who have been attempting to enter this country legally, specifically the 7,000 or 14,000, however many it is that have come here. And rumor has it, there's more that's about to make the same trek 
it's getting 100 percent out of hand. You know, do I think this wall that Trump is proposing is going to stop them? Maybe, maybe not. He wants to call it a slat, metal plates, whatever. He's attempting to do something to stop the illegal immigration. Does something need to be done? Absolutely. But there should be some sort of humane way to accomplish that. And let me bring this whole thing full circle. Here's one thing I find interesting in this gamesmanship that's going on between the House specifically because the Democrats officially take it over tomorrow and Donald Trump. I was on the show where Comp Central with Steve Appel, excuse me, where Comp Matters. And it was brought up the fact that with this latest proposal, budget proposal, Donald Trump was seeking $5 billion specifically in funding for his wall. Now, the Democrats offered, actually it was a bipartisan agreement, had offered $1.6 billion for border security, nothing for the wall. Everyone signed off on it. Donald Trump was going to sign off on it until Rush Limbaugh and I can't think of the other Fox News commentator and also the the hardliners in Congress talked to him. Well, of course, Rush didn't. He simply said, don't give up on the wall. Your, your base would never forgive you if you gave up on the wall. You won't get reelected. Your base will abandon you. And Donald Trump came because he didn't want to be seen as a weak man. And unfortunately, he, has, he did that to his own detriment and to the detriment of these now 800,000 federal employees that have been furloughed and are now going without pay. And I'm sure he's having buyer's remorse right now. Because when DACA was on the table, which the Democrats were immensely interested in, they put a package together for $25 billion. Yes, $25 billion for his wall. And he turned it down then because of the fact that, again, the hardliners said, no, you need to take a hardline immigration. You cannot give them DACA. You can't. No. And he didn't even though he had indicated that he would sign off on the legislation, just like he did recently. He indicated that if this bipartisan bill was brought to him, he would sign off on it. But then the naysayers got in his ear, and he changed his mind. And it's unfortunate, because there are people out there that are suffering, and it's going to expand exponentially, because I don't see any end in sight on this. I don't. Because right now, the Democrats, they're not motivated. Donald Trump and his administration, they have tried every way that they could to pin this on the Democrats. They blame the deaths at the borders on the Democrats. Uh, They blame the shutdown on the Democrats. They, They blame all these crimes that are occurring in the United States on the Democrats because they're, quote, unquote, they're weak on security. But the fact of the matter is, on national news, Donald Trump owned it. He said, quote, unquote, if I don't get the funding for my wall, I will gladly shut down the government. And as he has often done in the past, he has been true to his word. He can't escape that reality. He can't spin that. He can't because it's on record. There's no way to spin that story. There's no way to spin what he said. He owned the government shutdown. And he's also recently come out and he alluded to the fact that because of the new NAFTA deal that he put together, that Mexico is actually paying for part of the wall. Well, that's a load of baloney, too. That's not true. Because in the Trade Act, there is nothing in the language of that agreement that indicates that any of the money that's coming from the trade that we have in Mexico is going to fund the building of any part of that wall, 
reinforcing any part of that wall, doing anything to enhance security at the border. Nothing. And once again, his administration is found scrambling, trying to explain what he meant. But here's an interesting thing. And I don't know if anybody caught this. There is a retired Air Force veteran. He's actually a triple amputee. And unfortunately, it's something that that happened while he was on tour of duty and he got struck by an RPG. And he is a staunch Trump supporter, a staunch Republican. His name, and forgive me if I butcher it, first name is easy, it's Brian. Last name is Cole Flash, and that's K-O-L-F-A-G-E. Here's the interesting thing. He started an online campaign fundraiser for the building of that wall. His goal is $1 billion dollars to go towards funding the building of that wall. Now, some of you who are listening to the story, you're probably getting the biggest kick out of this and you're laughing, thinking how crazy that is. Here's the funny part. As of December 21st, and I have not checked since that date, as of that date, he has raised over $7 million to go towards that wall. Shocking, isn't it? And of course, there were the concerns about how could that money be given specifically to the administration for the wall. But there there are ways. There have been people, private donors, who have donated as much as $7.5 million for a cause, for a governmental cause. So I don't think that's going to be the any difficulty in him accomplishing that fact. But what also I've amaze me at the story is Mr. Cole Flash said they can raise that $1 billion very easily if every American citizen that voted Trump in pledged $80 they get that $1 billion. I think what I'll have to do at the next segment of the voice of reason i'll provide my listeners with a with an update see exactly where he is at this point or at that point on the airing of the show because i am curious myself as to how much money he has raised since then we're going to take a a musical break right now and i'll be right back You're listening to The Voice of Reason with Ted Durden, brought to you by Turchin Law, 818-230-3110. If you need any assistance with employment, labor, or workers' compensation law, call Turchin Law, 818-230-3110. And if you like The Voice of Reason, please subscribe and tell a friend. Now we go back to The Voice of Reason with host Ted Durden. Jordan. I'm also going to uh, I've got a segue into our relationship trends because there's just been so much that's been going on in, in Washington and Donald Trump with the governmental shutdown. I could really take over the entire show speaking about subjects of the day, but I won't do that. What I will ask for is for a little forgiveness on this segment because normally I'll talk about relationship trends, but I'm not going to do that on this particular episode. I'm going to do that in a couple of weeks. Be sure to tune in because it's going to be on the subject of men and women and their relationships and a man's tendency to correct his mistakes, fix his mistakes instead of being proactive and making sure that they don't occur saving everybody involved some heartache and anguish. What I am going to do next is go on to the most favorite part of my segment, and that is 
wine, and food. Now, what I'm going to talk about this week, the dessert, the holidays are over, but we are quickly approaching Valentine's Day. So as we get closer to that day, some of my subject matters, of course, are going to take on more of a romantic tilt. So this is one that you can practice and try to perfect before Lover's Day arises. The dessert that I'm talking about, if you're a chocolate lover, if you are a cheesecake lover, is chocolate truffle cheesecake. Now, the fact about this particular dessert, the preparation is time consuming because of the fact for it to be prepared correctly. Honestly, it should take you 12 to 24 hours. Now, it's it's not as bad as it sounds because the preparation of it doesn't take that long, but it's the completion of the process that does. So let's talk about, first of all, the ingredients that you're going to need. You're going to need to get one and a half cups of crushed dark chocolate and almond shortbread cookies. Now, you're going to need about 18 of those. My recommendation, and I'm not trying to give them a a free plug, the Keebler cookies. Keebler makes a product that's called dark chocolate and almond shortbread sandies. Get yourself a bag of those. One bag should be more than enough. You're going to need two tablespoons of melted butter. Again, butter, not margarine. And if you don't already know, when you cook with butter, you need to cook with unsalted butter if you did not know that. You're then going to need to get two four-ounce semi-sweet chocolate baking bars. Now, I have a preference when it comes to baking chocolate. The only type of chocolate that I use, and there's a lot of them out there, I use Ghirardelli's. Ghirardelli's, the way they make their chocolate, the way that it's processed, and then when you're cooking with it, the flavor is consistent. It always comes out smooth, no lumps, no separation. So my recommendation for this would be Ghirardelli's. That's what I use. Now, you're going to take those bars and you're going to chop them up. It's going to be kind of a coarse chop. You're going to need one cup of whipping cream. And whenever you hear me talking about whipping cream, if you go to the grocery store, you may see whipping cream, a heavy whipping cream. I always use heavy whipping cream. You'll need four eight ounce packages of cream cheese. I'm old school. I only use Philly, Philadelphia cream cheese. That's all I use. And and some of you did like real old school. You want to get one 14 ounce can of sweetened condensed milk. And those of you who don't know, those in the South probably do and your bakers probably knew sketch your old school bakers. I'm talking about carnation milk, condensed milk that comes in that red and white can. You also want to gonna get two speed two speed Jesus two teaspoons of vanilla extract. Now, I know McCormick, they make a real nice vanilla extract. It's imitation. But if you can find that genuine vanilla extract, you know, there was a, there was a movie called The Help. And Millie, who was known for baking her pie, she makes a statement. There's a line she has in that movie. And it's called, oh, you got that good Mexican vanilla. That's what you want to get. Now, there's a product on the market and it's called Island Vanilla. It's not imitation and it's real. That's what I would recommend for that. And then you're also going to need four large eggs. Now, the other part of this, you do this once the once the cheesecake has been made and has allowed the cheese to chill. You're going to need to make 
a ganache topping. Now, for the ganache topping, you can get these ingredients and you can set them to the side. And the preparation time for that is about 30 minutes. You're going to need a cup of heavy whipping cream, one four ounce semi-sweet chocolate bar. That's separate from what you're making the cheesecake with. So these are separate ingredients and another four ounce dark chocolate baking bar. Again, my recommendation, heavy whipping cream and Ghirardelli. That's what you would do. Now, let's talk about the preparation. So the first thing you're going to do is preheat the oven to 300 degrees. Take the crushed cookies and the butter and you're going to mix it together and you're going to take that mixture. You're going to have a, a, a nine inch cooking pan and you're going to crush that into the bottom of that pan. Again, you want to make sure, first of all, if you don't know, take some butter and grease up that pan because you don't want this to stick. So then you take those ingredients and you crush them. Now, the chocolate and the cream. If you want to do new school, you can put it in the microwave, put it on high for one and a half minutes. But keep an eye on it because you want to make sure that it's melted. So it may not take the full 90 seconds, but once it hits about 40, 45, keep an eye on it because you want to make sure that it doesn't start popping and explode all over the place. So after you do that, you're going to take the, the cream cheese, beat it at a medium speed with a heavy duty electric, either a stand mixer. If you have a handheld mixer, it should take around two minutes. But the bottom line is you want to beat it until this mixture is smooth. Then you're going to add the sweetened condensed milk and the vanilla, but you're going to just fold it in. You don't want to beat it in. You want to fold it in, use a spatula and just fold it in. If you want to use a hand mixer, just real, real slow or even don't even have it on and just blend it in until it's combined. The eggs, you want to add those eggs just one at a time beating that mixture at a low speed until it's just blended. Then you keep adding each egg after that. Now, once you're done with the eggs, then you're going to again add the chocolate mixture that you set aside and put that in again, beat it until it's blended, just until it's blended. So don't overdo it. That's important. Once you've done all that together, you now have your batter. And you want to take that and pour that into that pan where you have the crushed cookies at because that's your top. So you bake that at 300 degrees for an hour and five minutes. You want to make sure the center is set an old school way of doing it. Just take a toothpick, test it, stick it in the middle because it makes a small enough hole. If that toothpick comes out clean, then you know that it's done. So, once it has cooked and once it has set, turn the oven off, leave it closed and let it sit in there for another 30 minutes. Now, once you've gone through this whole process, then what you want to do is you want to take a knife. You want to go around the edge of the pan just to loosen the cheesecake. You're not going to take it out. You still need to leave it in that pan. So you want to leave it on a cooling rack for about an hour after that's done then you take it you cover it and you put it in the refrigerator now it needs to sit in there for no less than eight hours no more than 24 a compromise may be after everything is done maybe letting it sit for about 12 hours now, once that's done, then you make your ganache topping. Now, you don't make the ganache topping until the cheesecake at this point has had an opportunity to sit. So when you take it out of the refrigerator, then you can go ahead and make your ganache topping. And, and that's real easy to make because all you're going to do is you're going to take the cream, put it in a saucepan, 
and bring it to a light boil. Then you're going to take the, the chocolate bars. You're going to have them a coarse chop. If you have a food processor, you, you can put it in there, um, even, in, even in a blender. So then what you want to do is then take the cream and pour it slowly into either the food processor with the chocolate or if you have a blender, pour it slowly in through the top. Then you want to let it blend it until it's smooth. Let it cool at room temperature, which take anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes. Now, once you're done with that, if you've got your cheesecake already out, then you take this mixture, pour it over the top, start at the center, and just let it slowly drip where it kind of has a dribble effect on the side of that cheesecake. And you're done. And whoever you're making this for, will be so impressed. And as always, I have got to pair that with something. My, my go-to when it comes to chocolate, especially a deep chocolate truffle cake like this, you either pair with one of two wines, in my opinion. If you want to go with a sparkling wine, my go-to is Verve Clico. It's, a, it's an excellent French champagne. It's in a yellow bottle. Some call it yellow label, but it's Verve Clico, V-E-U-V-E-C-L-I-Q-U-O-T, Verve Clico. If you don't want the champagne, I would strongly suggest a Pinot Noir, beautiful pairing. That's the show for the evening. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it, listening to it as much as I enjoyed talking. And remember, always remember, ignorance prevails when the rational-minded do nothing. Good night, and be sure to tune in two weeks from now for the next episode of The Voice of Reason. This has been your host, Ted Durden. Have a good night. been listening to the voice of reason hosted by mr ted durden the voice of reason is produced and directed by appellant associates and is part of the wordcompmatters.org podcast channel all opinions expressed on the voice of reason are the sole opinions of mr ted durden and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of his advertisers or the work comp matters channel for the voice of reason my name is steve appell